right? So, you know, many examples, different areas, right? And this cartoon of Harris is very, uh, I think, to the point as far as we're concerned. Okay, so here's one of my favorite examples. Um, this is the first gravitational wave uh, detection by LIGO. And this is from the discovery paper, this, this figure. And you see this is the waveform, the strain, delta, delta L over L, the fractional change in the arm length as a function of time. And this is at Hanford in Washington. And this is at Livingston, Louisiana. And here, um, what, what, what they've done is they've taken this waveform and superposed it on top of this one. Yeah, I know for technical reasons it's inverted, but that's just because of the geography of the two sites. They have to change the orientation of the, of the detectors. But you don't, you don't have to do any fancy statistics, right? You can see by eye that these are the same waveforms, right? So these things are over 2,000 miles apart. So that's how we know that they saw a gravitational wave. They were monitoring the strain and well separated, not a terrestrial event with a very high significance, they saw a gravitational wave. But how can they claim this wave came from two black holes, 30 solar masses each that have been orbiting each other and then smashed into each other and produced this? this uh, thing far away. I mean, the whole idea is preposterous, right? That <laughs> nature would arrange to have, you know, not five solar masses, ten solar, 30 solar masses each, and have an event rate that was appreciable enough that on a NSF funding time scale, <laughs> you could see events, right? It's crazy. So how do we know that this happened. And the real reason we know is because of simulations, right? From, from solving Einstein's equations numerically on a computer, you set up initial data with suitably chosen masses and spins, and you get, you see the red here is numerical relativity. So what's done in the second part here is, first of all, this is smoothed in a certain way. So if those of you near the front can see there's some width to the gray here that's supposed to represent uh, uh, some uncertainty in the, because of the noise of the measurement. But you can see how well we, so this stands for simulating extreme space times. That's the name of our collaboration that produced this particular waveform. And you can see from the match to this waveform, that's how we know it was black holes. And that's, Okay, uh, numerical relativity, uh, so I just picked that because that's my field, but what I'm saying applies in general to computational astrophysics, right? That, that, that if you look back for any particular field of simulation, around the 60s is when universities started getting um, big enough computers that people could do interesting things. This is the first paper in numerical relativity by Hahn and Lindquist. And in modern language, this is the head-on collision of two black holes. And it's fun to read the paper. They did 50 time steps. This took three CPU hours on an IBM 7090. They had a grid. This was axisymmetric or head-on collision, 151 by 51 grid points. And they evolved up to 1.8 m. So this is relative to units. So you can think of m, m of solar mass uh, here. So a solar mass is five microseconds. But more important, the Schwarzschild radius is 2 m. So this is roughly a light crossing time across one of the black holes. Okay. So not very far. And then they have this great conclusion. In summary, the numerical solution of the Einstein field equation presents no insurmountable difficulty. <laughs> now, actually, if you read the paper, the reason they quit after 50 time steps was the code blew up. 
And so, in fact, I would come to the opposite conclusion. It presents many insurmountable difficulties. So in fact, it took over 40 years uh, before the full three dimensional problems, say, of orbiting black holes. So the focus of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the coming revolution, is related to solving PDEs, partial differential equations, right? So things like hydrodynamics, MHD, gravity, whether it's Newton or Einstein, radiation transport, you can add whatever your favorite set of PDEs in astrophysics is to this list. Um, but in particular, uh, I'm not focusing at all on n-body or Monte Carlo simulations, right? Because uh, I'm really interested in moving to bigger machines, exascale machines. And the methods that work on these uh, kinds of problems are not the relevant methods for PDE. You work on one of these fields, right? What I'm saying is partly relevant to you, but not as much as if you can do it. All right, so here's the dirty secret. The dominant algorithm we've been using to solve PDEs is essentially the same one that Hahn and Lindquist used in the 60s. And that's true of all of these. Of all these. It's finite differencing or finite volume. So for, for my purposes, I don't need to just, I mean, finite volume is a special kind of finite differencing. So I just use the word finite difference. There's no difference as far as I'm concerned. They both go back. Okay, so the first idea that it might be a good thing to look at more modern methods, right? It's not like applied mathematicians uh, have been sleeping for 60 years. They've been developing all kinds of interesting stuff, right? It's that we as astrophysicists haven't been paying attention. So in, in numerical relativity, the key thing is to recognize that the solution of Einstein's equations are smooth in the mathematical sense, right? We don't have shock waves or surfaces of stars. Uh, and, right, I mean, of course, I guess I know the singularities inside black holes, but that we can avoid by various techniques. So if you have smooth solutions, then any a numerical analyst would tell you, you should use a high order numerical method. So that's in the sense of you know, if you're making some Taylor series approximation, you should be out, you know, not just using some linear or quadratic formula, you should be using something of higher order because you get more bang for your buck then. Now the problem with trying to do that, so let's look here, this is supposed to represent grid points in some mesh that you're using to solve your PDEs. So if you want to get a derivative over at this point, a high order method means that you use information from several grid points in the neighborhood of this point. And then, you know, you can look in books and they give all these formulas with different powers of H and blah, 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 right? A centered formula, so that means that that this is at the sensor, center of the stencil of points that you use to approximate the derivative. As you go to higher and higher order, that's a stable process. The coefficients that go into those formulas stay bounded. Whereas the problem is eventually you get to a boundary. Right? There's some physical boundary typically of your simulation. And if you try, you can look at the books or you can derive one-sided formulas. So you can get a formula for the derivative here that uses these points. But that's an unstable procedure if you try to go to too high an order. The coefficients 
get very big and they alternate in sign. Right? And so you get huge cancellations and this just doesn't, eventually breaks down. So the way we handle this in practice, if this is an interior boundary, right, you divide and you grid up into subdomains, is we have another subdomain on this side and we communicate the information that we need at these missing grid points, these ghost zones. We communicate that information to this processor so we can use a more centered differencing formula here and we maintain the stability that allows us to use higher order methods. And now you can see where I'm going. As you scale to a million processes, this communication cost between all the different cells that you're using becomes prohibitive. If you spend all your time communicating instead of actually computing derivatives here. And that's the battle, that's the key issue to deal with as we look ahead to machines that are coming in the next few years. So in the case of Einstein's equations, uh, about 20 years ago, our group decided that we should take advantage of the smoothness and use what are called spectral methods. I'll explain a little bit more what spectral methods are, but in particular, spectral methods, instead of using uniformly spaced grid points, they use specially chosen grid points with a very with a bunching of points towards the end. And it turns out that with spectral methods, you can approximate a derivative, say here, using all of these points to get a high order approximation that's extremely stable. Okay, so you get around this point, you don't need the ghost zones the way that you do. So, so our code that implemented this is called SPEC, Spectral Einstein Code, and it works extremely well for binary black holes. And the basic idea of a spectral method, it's what you learn when you learn separation of variables. You take your solution and you approximate it as a superposition of some basis functions. But instead of this going to infinity, because we're doing this on a computer, you truncate this to keep n basis functions. And these basis functions are typically, uh, you know, if it's periodic, you use a Fourier basis. If it's not periodic, you can use polynomials, Chebyshev polynomials, genre polynomials. The details don't matter. So a spectral method is just the name that's given to how you evaluate these coefficients. You use the orthogonality of the basis functions. So the, the, these coefficients are just the projection of the solution along the basis function. That's the standard thing you learn in quantum mechanics when you're in a class. What turns this into a good numerical method is the pseudo making, turning this from spectral to pseudo spectral method, which again, not recent. Instead of doing an analytic integral here, which is very restrictive, you evaluate this integral by a Gaussian quadrature. Right? So a real, a, a finite numerical procedure with some weights and some uh, abscisses that you use, the, the, the points at which you evaluate your, your solution. So these are carefully chosen. There are books, there are functions, there are libraries that tell you how to get these, so this is all easy to do. So if you think about it, it's just like in quantum mechanics where theorists will talk about having a representation of the wave function either in position space or in momentum space. Here's the okay, labeling which of these things. So it's like having two different representations. 
And the nice thing about that is, if you want to take derivatives, you can differentiate this expression with respect to x, because you can analytically evaluate the derivatives of your basis function. So that's essentially exact. But if you have nonlinearities, so if your right hand side has you know f squared, what you can do is you can just take f at the collocation point and square it. So you can go back and forth between the spectral representation and the collocation, the physical physical space representation, depending on which is more convenient. So that's the heart of the method, and it's well described. There are lots of books and so on that you can read about this. Um, and the advantage of this is, as you get to large n, convergence of the method is exponential. So exponential here means faster than any power law, any power of n. So you're used to, you know, having like a second order finite difference method, meaning the errors go down as one over n squared. So you double the number of grid points, the error goes down by a factor of four. Here, when you double the number of grid points, you typically get a factor of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 10th improvement in your convergence. So it's really powerful in that sense. But there's no free lunch. The key thing is this is true for smooth solutions. Right, so if you have a shock wave, then what happens is you get Gibbs phenomena. Right? When you represent the discontinuity as a superposition on basis functions, in oscillations and overshoot. Okay, so the spec code does do things like neutron stars, but for that part, we just switch to a traditional uh, finite difference code, just like everybody else. But we want to be able to include, you know, even we numerical relativists need to include matter, right? As soon as we want to talk about neutron stars, like black hole neutron stars, neutron stars, neutron stars, right? This is the famous first uh, neutron star, neutron star event detected by LIGO. Here again, you see the, the uh, here's the strain data shown this time as in frequency, as a spectrogram frequency versus time. You see this rising uh, chirp signal, which is the, the representation of, of, the, of the H of, a, of the binary in spiral. And these are uh, counts from gamma ray detectors that were flying in satellites at the time. And you see roughly two seconds after the uh, merger of the black holes, you see this uh, uh, gamma ray. Right, so a lot of excitement, uh, you know, all kinds of press releases about kilonovas, and you know, they focus, of course, on the gold and platinum that's been produced. <laughs> I don't know why that's such a resonance with the public, but anyway, maybe it was with the reporters. Um, so we want to be able to simulate these, right? There's this, uh, uh, sorry, this field now. Uh, called multi-messenger astronomy, where the idea is that you have some event. Let's say here is a black hole tearing apart a neutron star, and this emits gamma rays and light to gravitate, all kinds of things. And each of these messengers contributes to the picture we build up of what this event is. So ideally, we would like to be able to simulate this event and calculate not just the gravitational waves, but all of these other messengers. So that's the, the holy grail, quite a long way off from doing, you know, an a priori simulation of this, but it's nice to read. Okay, so what are the challenges for the binary black hole codes? Well, unfortunately, our experimental colleagues are 
good and the signal to noise keeps improved, right? So in the next event uh, run will be, you know, probably roughly a year from now. That's the fourth observing run. The event rate is going to go up probably to be one a day or even more. Uh, so that means if you have something interesting that you want to do a special simulation for, running a simulation that takes three months is just you know, not going to cut it. You need to be able to do better. There will be some events we can hope. So the signal to noise of that first detection was 25, roughly. So between that event and 04, we can expect the signal to noise to go up by a factor of roughly four or something, maybe. I don't know, so, five. so roughly we need a phase accuracy over the whole in spiral um, and into the merger. Oh, it's, it's very, you know, I'm not doing this exactly, but a good rule of thumb is just take one over this. That seems to work. So, 0.01 after, you know, could be as many as 40 cycles if you're in band. Um, that's beyond what people are doing today. Okay, so you would need to improve the accuracy. And then if you look ahead to future uh, detectors and even go as far as LISA, LISA will have a signal to noise for supermassive black hole mergers of 10,000. There's no way you can take today's numerical relativity codes, even the spec code, and get this kind of accuracy. Moreover, if you don't get that accuracy, not only are you wasting billions of dollars, right, because you're not getting the maximum science, you, know, you should spend a little couple million on a few numerical relativities. <laughs> but, but worse than that, there are all kinds of other interesting events that Lisa will see, you know, in memories and white door binaries, all kinds of, I don't know, cosmic extremes. Who knows what they'll see? This is going to be the dominant signal. So to see what's hidden underneath the signal, some way or other, you need to sort of be modeling that strong signal and removing its contamination on the weaker signal. And if you make a 1% error in the dominant signal, you're not going to see anything that's hidden under it. Right? So this is a real, uh, a real challenge. Spectral methods, despite their power, they get their power by basically having relatively few subdomains, right? areas of grids and lots of grid points to get take advantage of the exponential convergence. So it doesn't help you to have a million processes because the number of processes is set by just the number of subdomains. So that's not going to work. Now let's look at neutron stars. There it's even worse. The current computational errors on Typical, say, neutron star, neutron star uh, merger uh, calculation, you know, depends how optimistic the people are and how big a computer they have access to, roughly, I don't know, 1 to 10 percent. In fact, we can't even quantify the errors often because often the way you quantify the errors is you run an increasing resolution. Right? And then you can see how the errors are scaling. You understand from the algorithm how they should scale. You could kind of infer what the errors are. But that assumes that you're already in the convergent regime, right? Where this Taylor series behavior is, do right? is, is dominant. You can use the first few terms in the Taylor series to approximate the error. We're probably not in that regime. So it's very hard. We just run with the most resolution we can afford, and then we publish that result, and we wave our hands a little bit about what we know. And simulations take too long. How the one for flying black holes are even longer for neutron stars, because you have all of these frequencies. Okay. 
but the, the real problem is the methods that we're using, these things that go back 60 years, do not scale to the next generation of machines. Um, but first, before I get to that, you know, this is astrophysics. What's wrong with 1% accuracy? You should be delighted to understand something to 1%, right? Well, there are many examples. For example, two neutron stars collide. They eject some matter. The matter is what produces the gamma ray burst and the kilonova and all these other things. But that matter is just roughly a percent or so of the total mass that you send in. So if you have a 1% error in your calculation, you have a 100% error in the properties of the ejector. So it's just, and there's an example. If you do core collapse supernovae, the initial conditions for that collapse involve an almost perfect cancellation between the gravitational potential energy and the thermal energy of the core. Okay, and then there's this instability that leads to the collapse. If you don't follow that small difference between two big numbers to better than a percent, you have a hundred percent error in the outcome. Right? You've probably been to talks about core collapse supernovae, and you know that every few years the the person presenting the talk changes from telling you the simulations explode. Whoops, no, they don't explode. Whoops, they explode. <laughs> it's, it's this problem, right? Not just do you have to get the physics right, you have to get the numerics right. There's a goal for LIGO and gravitational wave detectors in general to say something about nuclear physics by looking as the neutron stars approach each other and get close, there's a tidal deformation which saps some energy from the orbit and therefore speeds up the merger. So you cycle, you know, the waveform is a little faster phase evolution than if it was two black holes. And from that, uh, the amount of that effect depends on the tidal deformability of the neutron stars, which depends on the properties of the nuclear matter, the nuclear equation of state. So there's this dream of measuring equation of state properties from tidal effects. Well, the tidal effects are small. Right? You, you, need, you need to resolve the surface of the star to you know, probably better than a 1% in order to do this. And as the detector sensitivity improves, the problem becomes more and more acute. And then, of course, there's the cases where you get completely wrong physics if you don't have enough resolution in your simulation. Right? So if you have an instability like the, the MRI, the magnetorotational instability and accretion disk, if you don't have a fine enough grid spacing, you don't even see this instability. You'll conclude your disk is stable. Right? You just it's a completely wrong result. So it's exactly these kinds of interesting problems where you do need high accuracy despite it being at uh, astrophysics. All right, and it's hard, right? The solution isn't smooth. You have surfaces and shocks. You have multiple time scales. You have multiple spatial scales. So you want to have grid, you want to have an adaptive grid resolution. The geometry of the problem changes, you could have a disruption of a neutron star as it spirals into a black hole. Is a merger. You started with two objects, you end with one. Uh, maybe you form a black hole out of a collapsing remnant. And then, of course, there's multi-physics. Now, do you want general relativity? You want hydrodynamics, MHD, neutrinos, photons, nuclear reactors? Right? We're insatiable in our greed to add physics. So how are we going to deal with this? What's the answer? All right, so I'm proposing one answer, OK? It's called the discontinuous Galerkin method. Right? 
my DG for sure. And you notice, at least I have the modesty to put a question. You know, it's a little, <laughs> this is meant to be tongue in cheek. Right? So I'm not saying this is the answer, right? I should probably say is this is the answer that our group is pursuing. More accurate. All right, so let me let me explain to you very quickly what what this is. So a finite volume method. So here I've shown three cells in some in a one-dimensional uh, grid, and we approximate the solution. We have essentially one grid point. You can think of it as being at the center of each cell. So there's some constant value across the cell that represents the solution. So here's in green is the true solution, and we're approximating it by these horizontal lines. Okay, so now you notice that the boundaries here, there is a, these things don't match, obviously, um, but these things physically talk to, talk to each other via conservation laws. Right? So for example, the mass in this cell can change if there's a density flux from this cell into here, the mass of here goes up, right? So we need a, a recipe a prescription which tells us how to update, say, the mass in the cell because of flux coming in and flux going out. And if we do that badly, we get the analog of Gibbs phenomenon. But you know, you know, we've had 60 years to figure this out. There are very good prescriptions, called you know, limiters is the generic name given, given to how you do this, which can handle shocks. The problem with this method is if you want high order, you only have one grid point here. So to get high order, you have to couple together. You have to get information from not just the nearest neighbor, but could be several neighbors away. And that hurts you when you try to, when these other cells might be living on different processes and you have to communicate information. That's very slow part of the process. In a spectral code, the solution is expanded in a local basis. So here I've shown constant and x, a linear, right, first two terms of you know, polynomial of degree zero and degree one. But again, you've got a higher order. Right? So um, so here's the solution, the same green, but now approximated by a straight line with an offset to make a good approximation. Okay, so this will give you exponential convergence in smooth regions as you increase the order of this polynomial. But the flux here can't do shocks. You get Gibbs phenomena. The DG code tries to combine these two things. The solution is expanded in a local basis, just like in a spectral map. But the way it's done, you're allowed to use exponential, so you still get exponential convergence if it's smooth, but this formulation allows you to use more general limiters based on the ideas of the finite difference ones that in principle can handle shocks. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. All right, so we have a new code, uh, which we've called Spectre. Uh, some movie makers paid us a lot of money to use this <laughs> name for some movie. I forgot what it was about. But anyway, um, key thing is Moore's law is broken. Moore's law in the, in the, not actually as it was stated, but in the idea that the speed of processes doubles every so two years. That, those days are over, right? The, the size of a transistor on a on a modern computer chip is, you know, a few dozen 
atoms, you know, 50 atoms or something on the side. Um, you, you know, maybe he'll give another factor of two, but he's just not going to keep doubling. Um, the way that new machines are more powerful is by just having many processes. So here, yeah, this is actually an old, this is from 2012, but I couldn't find a, a more modern uh, a picture that showed what I wanted. So this one is nicely labeled. So PU is processing unit, and you see that they go from zero to 17. So there are 18 uh, processes here. Um, one of them handles I.O. And 16 of them are devoted to actually doing floating point operations. So 16. Um, does anybody know why there's an extra process there? Failure. Yes. What? Failure mode, right? <laughs> so they they you know they generate these chips, you know, by the thousands. And not all of them are perfect. So they designed them to have a spare processor. And then any as long as you know the one plus 16, 17 out of the 18, as long as 17 out of the 18 actually work, they can use the chip. So it turns out that's cheaper than throwing away everyone that fails. Um, all right, so modern machines, uh, those of you who worked on, on Terra and so on know that, you know, it's not 16 anymore, it's 128, 256. I'm not talking about GPUs. Okay. So why can't we take our current codes and run them on millions of processes? And it's because of the way we parallelize things. We have our spatial grid. We divide it up into subdomains, and then we distribute the subdomains to different processors. And then all the calculations that have to be done on one particular subdomain are handled by that processor that it resides on. Okay. And if it needs to communicate with neighbors or other things, then this use MPI or something to either send or get information. Now, most of the time, while the communication is going on, the processor is idle. It's not doing anything. You actually have to go in by hand and code in a special way. There are even people who code in machine language. Can you believe it? Some hydrodynamics algorithm. So that while the communication is going on, the processor can do something. That's not a way to make a living. So. <laughs> and then you have a load balancing issue, which means that different processes can be doing different amounts of work. You might have adaptive mesh refinement, a different number of grid points in different subdomains. Uh, you might be inside a turbulent neutron star on one subdomain, whereas you could be in vacuum propagating gravitational waves out to LIGO on another process. So uh, you might have to find where the location of the surface of the black hole is because you need to excise singularity from your domain. So you're finding parent horizon. It might be tracing light rays to do radiative transfer or maybe neutrino pairs. Okay, so all of this different kinds of physics is going on. And typically, right, we, we choose a time step and then we evolve the processes, get all the subdomains by that DT. And then when they've all gotten here, we, we do the communication to take the next time step. So you can see whichever is the slowest process here will set the scale, the time scale of your evolution. And in the worst case, you might have one processor that you're waiting to finish. It's what it's doing. And 999 
thousand other processes are sitting there idle, right? You're wasting the whole machine. And that's what will typically happen. This is what typically happens. So when we profile our spec code, and we have a particularly bad <coughs> domain distribution, the top process in terms of CPU time can be MPI weight. Right, which is MPI telling you nothing is happening. Yeah. That's bad. Right. So what's the solution? How are you going to? And the problem is worse the bigger the machine, because right? there are more processes that you have to somehow find. So we have a solution for that. It's called task-based power. And this is, I think, the real the the DG method is is nice. There could be other alternatives. But this is something that I think everybody should pay attention to, even if you do, even if you do Monte Carlo or N body, right? You should you should think about this. It's a new way of thinking about doing parallel programming. New to us, right? Not new to computer scientists. Right? They've been thinking about this for a long time. All right. So the conventional parallelization is you have a bunch of tasks that you want to do, you know, compute the, the spatial derivative in the volume of some subdomain, um, compute the flux term, send the flux to the neighbor, receive the flux from the other, you know, from the neighbor, um, whatever the tasks are. It can take different amounts of time, okay, and when, when the last one is done, you're now ready to take your next time step. So this is wasted time in terms of the, what you could be doing. In task-based parallelism, you design an algorithm where you think of each little piece of the computation that can be done on its own as a task. You have some supervising program which maintains a, a queue of tasks that need to be done. And then uh, whenever a processor becomes available because it's finished its task, it gets any of the tasks that's ready to be executed will be executed. So what's hidden in this is a lot of clever computer science about how you actually do this, how you do the bookkeeping, and how you make this efficient. Right? That's not something I would advocate for a typical physicist, even one in such a distinguished order to do. Okay? So you should rely on, like, just like you don't write an MPI uh, package on your own, you shouldn't write this on your own. So, this is re relatively new. There are no standard packages. You could do it yourself with a combination of MPI and OpenMP. I don't advise that. Uh, HPX is an is an example of a you know a small group at a university doing something. Uh, the problem with this is this is bleeding edge code. It's not stable. I don't recommend that. The only package that we found that that is mature enough to do it is CHOM++ that comes out of a group at Illinois, University of Illinois, has a big user base. There's a cosmology code, there's a chemistry code, so a bunch of codes that, are, that use that and that best. So, so here's an example of a standard test problem in MHD uh, that we ran uh, a little while ago when Blue Waters was still around and was the biggest machine that we could access to easily. Um, this was a relatively easy problem in the sense that it was a homogeneous computing load across the process. So we took a fixed size problem um, and then we ran it uh, from a small number of cores all the way up to fill the machine, um, roughly, uh, no, this was roughly, uh, and it's either 300,000 or 600,000 cores. I can never remember because this thing had hyperthread. Um, 
which, which was the real one. But made more than 100,000, right? And the fact that you get essentially perfect speed up uh, tells you that this is scaling. And the only thing that stopped this was the same machine. So this is encouraging. It says we may be on the right track here. Um, all right, so this is what task-based parallelism looks like if you profile it. So this is just a simple uh, NA probabilistic MHD test, 10 time steps. So the colors represent different um, procedures, different functions being called, like compute derivatives, compute fluxes, things like that, communicate things, and so on. So that's what these colors represent. So there should be 10 of them here. Um, the black is the overhead. That's the penalty you're paying to run charm plus plus. Okay. So that's it here. The white is idle time. So you see at the startup, not all the processes are busy. Right? But then as they get going, you settle into this pattern where there's no white. Everything is busy. Okay, And then at the end, as you finish, the machine shuts down, right, and you get this. All right, so our goal is to get something like this, you know, with 90% of the machine being used efficiently with no white. Now, I mentioned adaptive mesh refinement, right? You want to use fine grids where things are changing rapidly and coarser grids where you can but if you're doing explicit time stepping, you have this current condition to worry about. There's a minimum delta t, which is in order of magnitude set by the delta x, the size of your spatial group. So when you do adaptive mesh refinement, there's a smallest delta x, and there's therefore a smallest delta t that you have to use. Now, for efficiency, what you would like to do is only use that delta t where you need it to take bigger time steps in other parts of the domain. However, if you do that, your code doesn't scale very well, right? Because while you're waiting for the fine grid to take its time steps, the big, that you have big, you could take big delta t's, they're sitting there doing nothing. Right. So that gives you bad scaling. With task-based parallelism, you can um, avoid that, right? Because what you do is you have those other cores do some other useful task. While this, where the delta T is small, you um, pass that. All right, so here's a, just this. It's not a secret, right? It's, again, if any of you are submitting proposals for time on exceed or some other machine, uh, what you do, right, they ask you always, show that your code scales on Expanse or Frontera or whatever your machine is. And so what you do is you run your AMR code, but you use a global time step that's equal to the smallest one. Then you get perfect scaling, right? Because, you know, if you, Double the number of cores, it's fine, right? It all works. But in fact, typically what that means is you're using roughly 10% of the machine, typical applications, right? Because you didn't need to take such a small time step everywhere. Okay? But for some reason, the computer allocation committees haven't uh, figured this out. Yes. Of course, when you're on, a, on the allocation committee now, you'll know. <laughs> right, so there was a survey of these AMR packages. The scaling was bad if they had local time stepping. Uh, there was one exception, and this is a code. Right. Uh, so lies, damn lies, and statistics. This is a uh, quote that was popularized by Mark Twain. Um, but in my case, I want to adapt it to limiters. So I'm going to come back to, I told you that the DG method 
had uh, the ability to handle shocks because you could use limiters from adapted from binary. So you go to the literature, you can find all these things, and they show nice plots and so on. Don't believe them. Okay, they're just not for our purposes. They're useless. Right, so here's an example. This is a test standard sort of test case. It's a cylindrical blast wave. So you take a high density cylinder of fluid with a low density outside. You put a magnetic field on just to make it interesting to break the symmetry. So there's a magnetic field, I think it's horizontal. And then you let this thing expand. So there's a shock wave where the high density propagates into the low density. Now, if you look at these four pictures, these are done with the standard limiters for DG that are in the literature. Right? So this is a, a, a variation on um, a min max limiter. These are based on the Wino, H Wino limiters. This is another one. You can see they're terrible, right? There's all kinds of oscillations and non monotonicity. So these are very good. And what these are, you see, it's DGFD. It's a hybrid between discontinuous colloquial and finite difference. And the way it works is, let me show you here. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I'll show you in a minute how it works. This is another test case. So TOV is a Tolman Oppenheimer Volkov. It's a, a relativistic spherical star. And then again, to make it interesting, you add a magnetic field. So you have to do HD. Um, and this is using that limiter that I said was good. Um, and these vertical lines. So what you do is you set this up. It's supposed to be in equilibrium. B field is a small perturbation. Um, and it's not a perfect equilibrium. It's an analytic um, infinite resolution equilibrium. So when you put it on a finite grid, it oscillates a little bit so it comes to equilibrium. And these vertical lines are the known frequencies of the lowest few modes of oscillation. And you can see the nice, you know, we can pick out the frequencies here, maybe at least three. I don't think the four is really there. So that's a a test of how good uh, your code is at resolving this kind of thing. It's one way of testing. Um, and you know, adding the magnetic field doesn't you can still do it here. Uh, the, the magnetic field is not important dynamically, but it does stress the code because the field is strong. All right, let me show you quickly a, a movie. So this again is this uh, combination, right? And so the little black squares are where the finite difference code is being applied. And you can see it's only at the surface. Okay, and so you get a nice sharp boundary, which will be completely smeared out if you use a bad limit. All right, so what's going on is you try to do DG. So you start with, uh, you compute, this is at time n plus 1. You then check it. So TCI stands for troubled cell indicator. That's your um, psych, you know, psychotherapist who diagnoses whether this solution has too many oscillations or gives a negative density or something. If it succeeds, you don't apply any limiters. You just uh, accept it as the new step and go back and repeat. However, if it fails, you then project it onto, so with, this is now within each cell, you lay down a finite difference grid that's roughly double the resolution of the DG grid. You project onto those points. And you use a finite difference step over here with these very robust limiters that we know from doing 
finite difference thing. We then test that to see whether it's good enough to send back, restrict it back to the DG grid and do the DG whenever we can. If, it, if it's not good enough yet, uh, we go back and do finite, dif we keep doing finite differencing until, for example, a shock has propagated out of the cell into the So this idea of a subcell, we're using a different special purpose numerical method is I think the way to make this all work. Uh, and that's how we got to this good test. You see, we're doing things like real accretion disks and binary neutron stars and so on. This method will, will have some results. So just to summarize, all right, enough is enough, 60 years. It's time to open our minds and think about other numerical methods that may be appropriate to the hardware of today. Um, algorithms like DG are high order, they're local, they only use the nearest neighbor information, so you get good scaling. The limiters in the literature are poor, you should use, I think, a subcell method, which is a hybrid. And task-based parallelism is, I believe, crucial to be able to use the big machines efficiently. There will be some problems, you know, very homogeneous problems with very limited communication, which will work out of the box on big machines. Most stuff that we do will not. And if you want to find this, this is all open source. If you don't see the current state of the code. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Sam? I'm also uh, on Zoom here. So if there are folks online with questions, just raise your hand. Do you actually do the testing for the reconstruction whether you go to find that differencing or what's the actual criteria? Uh, so I, first of all, I'll tell you what we use in a second. I just let me say that there are many prescriptions in the literature, many things you try. So what we typically do is so in the in the DG method, we may have say five or six points in a self cell. So that's enough to get, say, of order four or five spectral coefficients, spectral coefficients of basis functions. So we just look and see if they're falling off sufficiently fast. If they're falling off sufficiently fast, that means we're, we're exponentially convergent. So that's good. We keep it. If you had Gibbs phenomena, then what you find is the high order coefficients, instead of getting small, they're just as big. So that tells you you have oscillations, and then we switch to finite uh, difference. So that's what we typically do. So you're basically trying to test uh, see if there's a Gibbs phenomena happening, and that you deduce from the finite difference tensile coefficients. We, 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 no, we deduce from the basis. Ah, sorry, yeah, yes, yes, exactly. coefficients. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So. So I'm curious about the subgrid finite difference. Yes. A lot of DG methods have really attractive physics interpretations, particularly with independent time steps. You have like little cells that have some momentum flux into the big cell and it stores it up over many time steps and then discharges it when it goes to evolve the big cell and you know so on and so forth. Usually associated with conservation laws. When you transition to the finite difference dynamics, you must just chuck all that out the window, right? Oh, no. So we, what? We, I mean, yeah. We, what happens? You, you you must have to pick that use, a very special finite difference. We use special method. finite difference methods that are conservative. Okay, and and it's possible to do that. It's possible to do that, and in fact, not only is it possible to do it, but um, in Neil Steppy, who developed this for us. Uh, his thesis is actually derived some new methods that um, 
not only are conservative, but they're adaptive order, so that in the finite difference part, you can actually choose whether to use a third order method or a fifth order method, whatever it is. I think there's a lot of scope for innovation. Thanks. Yeah, so it's something that was interesting to me that struck me about how the adaptive methods are able to capture sharp differences, but also smooth functions. And it reminded me of um, image reconstruction for interferometry. Um, and I was just wondering if you thought about how, if this could be applied to that or how. Easily. When you have sort of the sort of thing that I'm thinking of, for example, is if you're imaging a disc and then there's a sharp discontinuity yeah. and the disc is sort of smooth, but then there's an edge. Right. Um, point source, but it's so, so I'm not sure that finite differencing. See, the reason we, we use finite differencing is because we want to do a time evolution yeah. where uh, we have moving discontinuity. And so we need something that can handle that robustly. And that's what we, we use these numbers in image reconstruction. Uh, it's more a static problem, right? You have you have a, a sharp edge somewhere that you want to resolve, but you have infinite time to figure out how to do that. And it's a fixed location. So typically the methods that are used there involve uh, so typically your image might be represented by say Fourier coefficients um, you know that's what you get out of a radio telescope for example right so the Fourier basis is a bad basis for the discontinuity that's where Gibbs phenomena originally comes from so what you typically do there is you change your basis you represent the image not as a superposition of Fourier modes, but you use something else that is able to capture the discontinuity sharply. Without, right? So it's, it's a transformation of basis <coughs> that usually underlies those methods. I guess I'm thinking of a situation where you have perhaps two things going on. You might have a smooth background for a part and then a uh, um, and then a sharp edge or particular point sources with a with a relatively smooth so you know, sort of gas. So so again, I think I think fundamentally it's either it's either you subtract out the discontinuity, you know, as a step function or something, you fit a step function and subtract that from the data and hope the remainder is smooth, and then you could yeah. do that, or you change the basis. Those are the two. I know of how to do this. Yeah. Uh, I had a follow up question to both the limiters and the local time setting. I remember that in the past people were suggesting to combine both. This is that you basically use an aider stepping with a predictor step, apply the sub sub limiter just to that and communicate on the next one. Is that something you're doing also in conjunction right. so, with the... So in, in the, in the subcell business, there are two classes of the way you do. They're called a priori and a posteriori, right? So the a priori one is you sort of, you, you, you try to, before you take a step, you try to figure out whether it's going to be good or bad, and then you switch if you think it's going to be bad. Um, well, there, you know, since you never get it right, is some inefficiency. So the a posteriori, which is what we've implemented, is you always try the DG step, and then you inspect it to see if it's bad. And if it's bad, you actually throw it away and go and, and redo it. And that seems to be, even though you're kind of wasting the thing, in, on average, that seems to be better. So, uh, I haven't looked in detail at these ADER type things about whether there's a way to combine those two ideas. Let's take one more question. Okay. Uh, so, from what I 
understand you're still doing sort of cycling and time stuff. Should I worry? Like, does DG and FD like resolve the typical interpolation problem that we have when we use different time steps for different resolution and when you interpolate things on the same grid? Right. So uh, it's not that they resolve it. You have to design a time stepper that will take care of that. So there was a I flashed by a, a thesis project of my student Will Throw, uh, T-H-R-O-W-E, so you can look up, he has a paper in uh, Siam Journal on uh, Computational Science, where he designed, so the problem is if you go to the literature, the whole literature on local time stepping, again by applied mathematicians. So typically they are either at most second order accurate and conservative, or they're higher than the second order, but they're not conservative. And for us, doing hydro MHD conservation is crucial to maintaining stability of the solution. It's not just you need, it's not just conserving to truncation order, you want to be conservative to machine precision. And so uh, Will designed uh, an algorithm that is principal arbitrary order. You can make it as high order as you want. Um, I mean, it may not be useful to <laughs> just saying principal is you know, in order. And is conservative. And he had to figure out how you do the interpolations to keep those properties. And so. That's a, re that's a, uh, you know, it's one of these things which is an important contribution that only a few aficionados will appreciate. But it's actually a very important.